I'm Tim Ash, the president of the Senate, and I'm joined today uh, by Senators Phil Baruth and Debbie Ingram, who are the chair and vice chair, respectively, of the Senate Education Committee. And uh, over the next hour, we're going to be talking to uh, some school teachers and staff uh, to get a real-time sense of some of the uh, concerns or things that are being done to ready for uh, whatever education looks like uh, come September. And um, we are not gonna solve all of the problems facing reopening, but this is a chance for us to do some fact finding in advance of uh, the legislature's return in a few or a couple short weeks. So um, I'm gonna let uh, Phil and or Debbie say a quick word uh, about the education committee and taking in this information. Uh, then we'll immediately turn over to our four guests and uh, also want to alert people who are watching this that uh, the Senate is going to have what we call an all Senate caucus, meaning all 30 senators are invited to participate uh, in a more informal structure on Wednesday at three o'clock with Secretary French. A number of people have uh, submitted questions for today which are probably best directed for that conversation. And so anything that we don't touch on today, we'll make sure that we uh, raise with Secretary French and give him uh, some heads up so he's prepared to uh, respond to some of those questions. So uh, I will cease my opening monologue here. And uh, Phil, if you might just say a quick, quick word from the Education Committee uh, perspective. Sure, thanks, Tim. And uh, hello to everybody watching. I know it's an anxious time, and I just want to quickly lay out what uh, the legislature is and isn't doing at the present moment. So in the middle of an emergency like this, the Vermont Constitution gives the governor the power, the executive, to move very quickly and nimbly and to, frankly, act while we're on recess, which we will be until the end of August. But the legislature's role is really to oversee the executive branch, and that's what Debbie Ingram uh, and I and the rest of my committee have been doing. One of the things that we also try to do is collect facts on the ground and opinions and worries and questions and move those up to the level of the Secretary of Education or the governor. So for instance, uh, the governor just announced pushing back the statewide start date. That was something that began in calls with members of the NEA and other teachers and staff who uniformly asked us for more time. And so speaking for myself, my counterpart in the House, Tim, other leadership, we began to ask the administration to um, think about that. And the upshot was that that became the executive order. So I'm hopeful that today, as in other calls with other teachers, I can pick up things that my committee can uh, work on in August but between now and August, take directly to that executive level and see if we can't move on them, even if the governor is reluctant. Great. Um, and uh, at this point, let's, let's turn right to it. Um, I know we have a, a pretty sizable crowd watching on YouTube, uh, which I think is uh, understandable given the level of complexity, but also the number of uh, Vermonters that are impacted. Um, so we have with us four guests today. Uh, we have Lindsay Lefebvre, who's a math teacher at North Country High School. We have Jim Johnson, who is a transit uh, a bus driver at the Champlain Valley School District. We have Chris Guros, who's a special ed instructor in Montpelier. And we have Alice Shermerhorn, who is an art teacher at the Mary uh, Hogan uh, Elementary School in Middlebury. And I think I'm gonna start Alice with you, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll volunteer you to go first. Um, and you can give us, give us your sense uh, as from the elementary school perspective of how you're readying yourself for uh, the current plans uh, in your district with the state guidance, some of the challenges you see, if any, um, and, and then we'll take it from there. 
once you've unmuted yourself, we will have the benefit of, there we go. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Senators Ash, Bruce, and Ingram for continuing uh, to include educators in the conversation and planning a safe and realistic reopening for the fall. Um, that's paramount, and I want you to know how much we really appreciate that. Um, last spring, I was certainly amazed, but not surprised at how all the educators I work with turned on a dime to provide online supports for uh, families, both social, emotional, and uh, learning needs. And I must say that during the bus parade at the end of the year, uh, seeing uh, the plethora of smiling faces and families waving exuberantly at the buses and vehicles as we passed, I knew that the families really um, were showing us uh, their support and appreciation of those efforts. So such a great group of professionals uh, in this state, uh, amazing educators and staff. So I'm very lucky. Uh, we're all lucky in that regard. Um, our district is working very hard. We have several task force or a main task force broken down into different groups that is working on the reopening. And of course, um, the Champlain Valley Superintendents Association of which uh, our superintendent is a member. Uh, that group is working uh, to make some decisions, of course, on reopening. Uh, we are using that the hybrid model. And many of the concerns we have right now in our district are that um, although we're all going forward and um, in great detail with concern and creating these models, uh, because of some of the difficulties that we face, uh, some of the problems, are we creating a model that we can sustain? And um, unless, we've, unless we tackle some of these problems head on, we may be creating um, a system we can't sustain. So some of the things that um, I want to ask first our state to help us with uh, is supporting districts to provide any safety nets for um, sick time or sick benefits for staff. Um, it used to be a teacher might go into school, of course, or a staff member with um, a, some sniffles or some sort of um, mild illness. Um, our nurse used to say if everybody was home with a cold, no one would be in the building. Uh, but now that's changed. So people might not have the sick time to stay out. You know, a minor illness could take days um, before you're able to come back. So we really need to be sure that districts have the support and funding to uh, take care of that COVID related um, protocol uh, for staff. Another thing that I'm really concerned about is our lack of substitutes. Right now, you know, folks right now are going, oh, we'll take care of it, we'll do it. And it's like, well, just hold on. We didn't have enough subs before. Many of our subs we had in our district are not coming back because of um, their age and COVID concerns. So really this is an issue that could shut us right down. We need to hit, hit that uh, head on. Uh, child care for teachers. Um, is our, our, that the legislator is fully funding schools so that when this is over, we can get right back at it. Um, but I know that my colleagues, I'll stop there and turn this over to my colleagues. I'm sure they'll add to that list. I have other items, but I think that'll get, get us started. So thank you. Debbie or Phil, any, any questions first for Alice before we turn to our next guest? Or would you like to wait? Okay, we'll we'll wait, and then we'll we'll do it at the end. So, Jim, we'll uh, we'll turn to you next, and uh, just explain to people what you do, and and then same kind of questions. You're coming at it from a different perspective on the transit side, and give us the sense of what the challenges are and and how you guys are preparing. Yes, thanks, Senator Rash. Uh, my name is Jim Johnson. I've been a school bus driver for uh, Champlain Valley. Union School District, which is the towns of Williston, Shelburne, Hinesburg, and Charlotte for uh, 30 years. That makes me feel old to say that out loud. Um, and obviously, I have a little bit of a different perspective because my classroom, quote unquote, is 40 feet long and 10 feet wide, and I have to navigate streets with it. So, um, you know, I don't have the option to, to work remotely <laughs> when we're not in school. We, we did provide some meal deliveries and we're involved in a great number of 
bus parades at the end of the school year, which I see kids get really excited to see, you know, see the fire engines and the, and the school buses and stuff. Um, you know, my concerns, obviously, safety and to borrow a, a quote that or a term that the that governor scott uses as we as we turn the spigot a quarter at a time um i was happy to see that there was going to be a delay in school because i think turning that spigot a little bit at a time as we try to figure out these safety protocols and from a transportation standpoint i'm concerned about you know health checks that have to be done on the bus um personal protection equipment that i will have to use i'll have to drive the bus as i'm uh, you know, masked up and possibly eye protection. And I'm going to, at this time, possibly have to take temperature checks of kids while I'm, while I'm driving. And um, I can tell you if after 30 years, nobody likes to be behind a school bus when I'm running on time. Um, so, you know, those are my instant concerns as we actually get back to school. Um, and then to kind of piggyback on Alice's thoughts is, you know, one of the things that we have to worry about is 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 funding going forward especially for me um I, i'm hoping that the legislature can work with the vermont department of health about like testing capabilities um school bus drivers were at a shortage long before the pandemic started and as cold and flu season comes along i think any educator will tell you at times in the past that we've we've come to work with sniffles or a slight fever and that's not going to be an option um, so there's the safety aspect of that, but it also puts pressure on the rest of my drivers if I can't come in. Um, and are we going to have enough people to make sure that the school is staffed, that the bus is staffed? Um, so I'm hoping that there's maybe a testing program that, that might become available to, to schools. Um, you know, it's just a, it's a scary time as we all have this anxiety to go back. I think it is time to, to open that spigot a quarter turn, uh, but I'm hoping that there's a lot of uh, safety protocols that come with that. Before we turn to Lindsay, Jim, can you say a word about, you know, I, I think a lot of people are still trying to understand how the transportation would be impacted from the student's point of view. And I know at one point there was talk of, you know, skipping every seat or, you know, things like that. Well, how, how are you seeing this, the guidelines for, for the number of students who will be allowed in a bus at any one moment uh, we're playing out in, in, in the real world. Yeah, so we have got some guidelines, not only from the safe opening schools document that came out a while ago, but in, in my own district. And it, we have different sized buses, Tim. So it's, it's not one flat number, but our, our largest buses, which usually can hold a capacity of 90 students, will be limited to 28 people on that bus. And it's every other seat, um, with the exclusion that if you have brothers or sisters from the same household, that already are in contact with each other, they can sit together, but it's one per seat, every other seat. Uh, we, we are gonna be implementing some sort of health screening. Some of those details are still to be ironed out. Um, and we're gonna be doing the hybrid model here in the Champlain Valley. So we're looking at half of the number of students uh, on any given day. So I think that'll help in the bus, but the, the district has not reached out yet to who you know who actually is going to be attending school so we're probably going to have to redesign some routes to accommodate those safety measures uh, but yeah the it's going to be anywhere from depending on the size of the bus 15 to 28 students and and that's all that's going to be allowed to to accommodate as much social distancing as possible and then of course due to the the mandate not only staff but students will be wearing masks as well Okay, great. So we'll follow up uh, with both of you uh, when we wrap up. Thanks for the extra bit of intel. Uh, Lindsay, so you're up in the North Country um, yeah. and you're a high school teacher. So a little different uh, from uh, Alice's universe. Uh, so why don't you uh, give us your sense? Sure. Well, as with most of my colleagues, the prospect of returning to school is emotional and a little bit scary because it concerns the well being of our loved ones, our family. Uh, and our students for whom we care very deeply. Um, and that's why I've spent so many hours in meetings and sleepless nights trying to get through the myriad of questions and concerns that we have. Uh, I think we're all desperate to get back in our classrooms and try to get back to normal, but continuing to kind of struggle to convince myself that that can be done safely. Um, we know that as school communities, we can do extraordinary things 
when called upon by circumstance. Last spring, we saw educators and uh, school staff step up in ways that I don't think anybody could have imagined we would do. And I saw my colleagues do things that demonstrated creativity and adaptability that in genuine selflessness beyond anything we imagined. And while far from perfect, that transition to remote learning in the spring assured us that our faculty and staff will do whatever it takes to support our students. But we also learned in the spring just how much planning and preparation is required to really shift our system, our educational system into something that is going to work in such a different circumstance. And while the previous release state guidance on reopening schools is an important tool, it's, uh, and I appreciate its goal, it's also raised some real issues in planning in our supervisory union. Um, we recognize that the document is intended to be uh, a bit open and leave room for individual schools to interpret and do what's best for them. But that same ambiguity has also led to more questions in some cases than solutions. Some administrators within the same supervisory union are interpreting the guidance as suggestions and perhaps best practice. Um, maybe we should try for six feet, but it's okay if we can't accomplish that is what I'm hearing. Um, and others are really adhering to it as requirements. So a statewide plan that include clearly delineated requirements based on local testing and data would be really helpful, I think, for all of us. Um, we all have a great deal of respect, as Jim mentioned, for the systematic approach that's applied to reopening the state's economy. And it seems logical to apply that same approach to the reopening of our schools. Um, it feels like a full turn of the spigot is happening um, all at once, which is a little bit scary because who knows if we'll be able to close it or slow down the flow once we open it. Um, it's an interesting, I guess, juxtaposition that I have to register my vehicle via the mail because the DMV is perhaps too dangerous to enter and yet we're fully reopening our schools. So that contradiction is a tough one to, to talk about with teachers and try to really justify that. Um, I think as we've seen, our schools are the heart and soul of our communities. And I have majorly conflicting feelings uh, keeping me up at night. Like I really need to see my students. I need to get back to our schools, but to do that safely, I'm just really questioning if we can do that with such an ambiguous plan in place right now. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Um, and Chris, why don't you uh, wrap up our kind of introductory comments uh, from the Montpelier and special ed perspective. Sure thing. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is really highlight the work that special educators have been doing since schools shut down. Um, if you think about students receiving special education, uh, these are students that it was really hard to envision how we would make distance learning work. And I know uh, special educators around the state were working morning till night, meeting individually with their kid, with their students every day to make sure that they got what they needed. Um, and that will continue this year and be even better should we need to go remote for a period. Um, in terms of this year, uh, Montpelier Roxbury uh, has been working. I mean, I haven't People talk about summer break. I haven't really had a summer break this year. Uh, there was about a week when school was closed. And since then, I've been meeting uh, weekly with my superintendent and the admin team, along with um, members from the teaching staff, the custodial and clerical staff and paraprofessionals to plan for how we're gonna make this work. In addition to that, we've been meeting at the building level to, to solve problems specific to each building. Uh, now our plan in Montpelier Roxbury uh, right now we we believe that we can get we can have five day a week a week schooling K through eight because we think we're blessed with the space to do that. Uh, that said, even though we've been working all summer on this plan, there's just a number of unanswered questions that uh, I lose sleep over just about every night, and those are uh, we have a number of staff upwards of probably thirty percent that either have a high risk health condition or live with somebody that has one. It could be their partner or their child. And it certainly does not seem ethical to me to force those people to go back into the building. I have trouble even 
thinking about how to make somebody who is just uncomfortable and anxious with this whole plan, how to force them to go into a school building and be in front of uh, middle schoolers, elementary schoolers, high schoolers, and expect that to go well under the constraints that we have. Uh, so I'm, I'm concerned about whether some of the plans that are being put together are, are capable of actually staffing in a sustainable way. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, as a, as a union leader, I can wake up some days and look at my calendar and say, oh, there's, it's a free day. And next thing you know, I'm on the phone all day with uh, teachers that want to talk about whether they could retire, whether they could take a leave and things of that nature. And um, that worries me. And um, as has been said, you know, the, the state the Secretary of Ed and the Governor have really taken a local control stance on school reopening, and so that's kicked a lot, a lot of the work to the locals, obviously. And in Montpelier Roxbury, you know, our admin team working in collaboration with us, which is important, uh, we put together what I think is a, is a fairly solid plan. I wouldn't say 100% safe because nobody can say that, but I think about as safe as we can get. But when I look around the state and talk to some of my other colleagues, you have districts with completely different plans and some are interpreting the guidance completely differently. And when it comes to, to, to a global pandemic, we're only as safe as our weakest link. And so I worry that in some places I might say, ah, six feet, not that important. Uh, and you know, all it takes is a couple districts for an outbreak to start, and then the whole state's going to be shut down again. And so how to balance that idea that we could go back into uh, distance learning with providing high quality in-person instruction. You know, we're trying to plan for both and it's a heavy task. There's certainly another, a number of other issues I could talk about. Um, I guess one other thing I should highlight is I have a lot of questions about special education that I don't feel I have answers to. Um, a lot of districts are really operating on a pod model, uh, trying to minimize risk by, by limiting the contact that each student has with staff, trying to keep them contained. Typically, I would be pulling kids from all over the building, working with them in a groups, going into different classrooms. And it's clear it's not the safest thing in the world anymore for me to be doing that. So that guidance that tells us kind of the best practices for how to provide special education services during a pandemic is critically important. And I'm worried that if it comes out at the 11th hour, it's gonna throw yet another wrench in some of the plans being made. Thank, thanks all four of you for giving us the sort of, you know, a pretty expansive view at the different levels within the schools. Uh, Debbie or Phil, uh, questions to get us started? Uh, Debbie, go for it. Thanks. Um, but yeah, let me just say first of all, I, I mean, I hear in in your in your voices how uh, how concerning this is to you, and um, you know, just want you to want to acknowledge that. And I know you're uh, you all care very deeply about your students, and and you're um, you're doing your your very best to make sure that all of this happens safely. So I want to thank you for that. Um, I, I'm not sure who to direct this to, but I, um, or but let me just ask one con, one concern that I have or question that I have is what happens if you, um, you know, like Jim mentioned, um, you know, taking temperature checks, even when the kids get on the bus, what, what happens when you find that a child, you know, has a temperature that's, you know, too high or, you know, but maybe their parents have already gone to work or I mean, have you, have protocols been set up for for how that's going to be handled, or are there plans to have you know um, you know in, in space in an infirmary to isolate kids, or, or have you have you been told how that will be handled? Well, Senator Ingram, at least as far as the bus part, I I don't have answers to those questions. I have not got those from my administration. Uh, I, we have talked about that, especially with younger kids. Um, I've asked my district to have a policy where a parent can't leave a child uh, at the bus stop without supervision, um, which is something, you know, parents sometimes has to go to their own work or, you know, they know the bus is coming. Uh, it's, you know, we're not quite at winter time yet, but I certainly am concerned that if I have a child who, who's, who has a temperature that I can't let on the bus, because that could potentially expose 
28 other kids to that, but I also am not going to drive away and leave a, a, a child, certainly in grade school, high school might be a little different, but somebody should still know that that child, uh, you know, is exhibiting some, some signs. Um, so I don't have, I, you ask a great question, questions that I've been asking, you know, my admin and it's, we're still playing that game where you make plans too early and then things are changing so rapidly. Uh, but as we rapidly approach the end of summer, um, I wish I had an answer for you for that. I don't. Well, that's a very interesting logistical challenge it presents um, yeah. for sure. Uh, Phil? Your uh, mute button. I think Alice maybe had an answer to that. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say on our district, they're trying to still work that out. So we're talking about, uh, do we require an adult with the child at the bus stop, whether if the parent had to go to work, are they assigning someone? Um, to stay with their child. So we're talking about the you know, a potential of children coming with a little slip of paper saying they've had their temperature checked, that that's taken care of at home. So we're still have in dialogue with coming up with what solution uh, would be appropriate. Great, it's something that we'll raise with Secretary French because I think you know, parents throughout the state understood when the state shut down effectively that we were all in it together and we all had to change our normal routine and practices. And this is one where uh, it doesn't seem like districts can really come up with different policies for what you do with a kid who's alone at the side of a road because there's really only one response which is to make sure the kid is okay and gets safely back to wherever he or she came from. Um, so I do have a, a yep. question. So one of the things that's concerned me a lot is, um, I'll call it teacher flexibility or teacher choice. So if you remember back to the early days of the emergency, the administration decided they wanted uh, a mandatory program to set up childcare for the children of essential workers. And they were going to mandate that districts provide this childcare, in some cases, using teachers who didn't normally do childcare to serve that function. It was not voluntary, it was not flexible. And as a result, the administration had to pull it back and make it voluntary. So I, I fear that a similar thing is gonna happen here if there's an across the board mandate that all teachers go back into the classroom because many have family members who are at risk and they're gonna vote with their feet and to their own detriment in terms of salary or uh, potential punishments. So is there, is there any flexibility in your districts that allows someone with vulnerable family members or who themselves feels vulnerable to opt for fully remote instruction? I don't know who to direct it to, but um, feel free, anybody to kick it. I can take that one. Uh, so it's certainly a priority for me and our superintendent to uh, protect people who have a vulnerable health condition. Logistically, um, you know, teachers in, in schools have extremely specialized roles. So if 30% if, if of your staff roughly has a, a health condition uh, that makes it so maybe they should teach remotely, that doesn't necessarily line up with how you staff the school. Uh, you know, it, there's scenarios where it could wipe out a whole department. You know, let's say for example, that all the special educators in one of your school needs to work remotely. That becomes a problem. So I, I think it's it's a priority that we, we need to do that. But I, myself and our administrators have yet to solve the problem of how you do that and have the appropriate staff in the school. Um, but yep. I, I, I personally believe ethically we need to, at the very least, protect those that are vulnerable or live with somebody who is vulnerable. Well, let me let me ask a, a related question, Lindsay. Maybe I'll direct it at you. I, I've heard from teachers, and I'm sure Debbie and Phil have also some teachers who are concerned about their own health and you know for whatever uh, u unique circumstances, and their uh, their administrators are 
trying to make it work to teach remotely. Um, others are being told, well, you know, we have it designed that you're going to be teaching in person. So you'll have to be on, you know, leave, you know, like a medical leave of some sort. Uh, so you have different district leadership in a way giving different responses to the exact same predicament. And I'm wondering if, you know, if, you know, Chris says 30% as an average might be uh, might be have a profile with with vulnerability or susceptibility at a higher risk. W what are you seeing up at North Country? Uh, yeah, we're not seeing much of a systematic approach. I don't know that it's been addressed at the the district or supervisory level. What we're hearing as a message is that if you have a concern about your own personal health or that of one of your family members, um, that you should apply for a leave of absence or um, submit sort of a personal petition as to why you might need to work from home and how you might do that. It's really kind of falling on individuals to make that decision and almost that plan. Um, we've tried to, as Chris mentioned, throw around the idea of how we might align those teachers with the necessary instruction. But in our supervisory union, we're actually all individual districts at each building as well. So North Country Union High School is its own district. Um, the elementary schools are each their own district as well. So we don't have as much leeway to use teachers from one building where there might only be seven fourth graders to help assist with the whole group of remote fourth grade learning. So that's a certainly a roadblock for us. Um, so we've that's really the only message we've received at this point is that we should address that as individuals and perhaps apply for a leave of absence okay great that's clearly a system-wide issue that we're gonna have to be confronting um and it does raise other uh, uh, labor management issues or workplace uh safety issues in the grand scheme of things um that we'll have to have to be on top of um, other questions, Phil or Debbie, um, before I start sifting through a number of the ones that have come in. Uh, I'm, I'm fine. Debbie? I just ask, um, ha has there been any kind of informal attempts to um, uh, reach out district among between districts to have some consistency um, or, or you just really feel like there's a total just all local control and and no um, no real sense of anybody trying to coordinate a systematic even my region um, consistency. Allison, I think some are as I said. I know the Champlain Valley Superintendents Association was working together, so that was a, a group. Um, and I think possibly down south there may be groups working together. But a statewide approach is helpful for, some, of course, as we know, for some of these things. But that is being problematic with having this kind of fracture for folks. For sure. I mean, my question, I don't quite know who's best uh, directed to. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask Alice. Uh, and this may be something, Chris, that you want to touch on from a special ed uh, point of view. One of the questions we had submitted, um, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just read it rather than try to paraphrase it. It says, many school districts around the state are offering remote only options for parents and families to opt into. This means that those students who have the means and support system to be out of school can be, but those students who do not will be sent to the school building, creating an inequity in the school system, further separation of the haves and have nots in our communities. Um, and it gets to a concern that I know Debbie and Phil and I have heard. On the one hand, there are we hear people saying uh, we need everybody to stay at home because it's the best way to make sure fewer, the fewest people are infected. Then on the other hand, we hear if kids don't go back, especially lower income children and those with special uh, education needs will be the ones most seriously disadvantaged. Now, those are statements that we hear. Um, and I'm wondering, Alice, from your point of view, is the is that opt, I don't know if it's opt in or opt out, but the remote option approach, how is that playing out in Middlebury right now? Are our parents already signaling that they're gonna avail themselves of that option? And if so, is there any uh, sort of characteristic of the families that are choosing that option or is it too soon to tell? 
Yeah, uh, we definitely have people that are taking that option. I mean, right now I can't give you the exact number because I know that that can be changing. I think I heard a number a while ago, but um, that changes daily, I'm sure, with who's uh, opting in and out. Um, and I really can't t tell you right now um, who those families are. But, um, but I agree, we have had that concern that it's going to be the haves and have nots. And it's certainly something that we need to address um, and, and very concerning. I think that that's definitely an issue that we're grappling with right now without a solution at this point. For, for, school for, for families, Alice, who do not have uh, financial resources to speak of, um, you know, technology at home can be a barrier to really being able to continue, you know, meaningful continuity of education. It, are, is your district providing additional resources for those kids who are have been at home and likely will be if their parents choose that option? I'm yes, thinking, absolutely. Just, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go yes, ahead. absolutely. Um, ACSD has uh, done a you know, an extensive job in being sure that families were connected to broadband. I know that broadband in our state is an issue and certainly we are hoping that the state will help support and be um, overseers and, and to be sure that everyone is connected appropriately. Um, but our, our school district definitely was working on that along with providing, um, you know, laptops or iPads, you know, um, but Chromebooks <laughs> is the word I was looking for. Uh, Chromebooks to students so that they could um, engage. Yeah. And, and Chris, from the special ed side, because we also hear that that's also a particular problem. And obviously, special education services aren't one size fits all. But any, um, what's your reaction as someone uh, in the field to whether that might tip the scale towards? having the students come back, knowing that many others are concerned that we should not bring them back. How, how do you see that, that challenge? Yeah, just thank you for bringing up the equity issue because it's something that we thought about a lot. Um, it took us a little longer than other districts to decide to offer the remote only option because that was a concern. I will say that the, our numbers for Montpelier Roxbury were somewhat surprising when we put the remote option out there. It's holding steady at about 17% of families that want the remote only. And frankly, we thought it would be higher. I don't have the information yet about what the demographics are of those families, although I know Secretary French is concerned about this issue and has asked each district to send in that data. Um, you know, I think a lot of us read the article in the New York Times about the learning pods and how, you know, families of means are, are going to be able to weather this storm a little more comfortably than others. I've also heard anecdotally that there's um, some individual teachers being approached by families and saying, hey, if you took a leave of absence, some of us would pool together and pay you to teach our kids this year instead of sending them to school. That's a concern as well. And uh, lastly, one of, the, one of the considerations that districts certainly put, uh, had to think about when they decided to offer remote only was, um, you know, if a parent chooses to homeschool their child, that's a significant loss of funding for the school district. So one consideration is if you don't put a remote option out there, that family may decide to homeschool and then they're no longer a student in that district, which is a funding problem. Mm. Um, so that, that was a consideration there is of districts doing that. That's a good one for us to file away, Debbie and Phil, to make sure a district doesn't suffer uh, the calculation as a result of families making these these kinds of kinds of choices. Um, another a question. This one uh, heads your way, Jim. Uh, when bus drivers fall ill with or without COVID, especially in the late fall, in early winter, how will we transport students to and from school when the drivers are quarantining or recovering their health? Um, you had said, I believe, that you already struggle to find drivers. Uh, but it's not wouldn't be the first time that a driver maybe at the last minute calls in and says, you know, I I shouldn't be showing up at work because I might have symptoms related to COVID. What what's your uh, best laid plan here in terms of uh, meeting that challenge? 
Well, and that is one of our biggest challenges. And I speak to our admin and my transportation supervisor on a daily basis. Our district is rather large, so we have a large number of drivers. So the hope is that we can we use an alert now system that alerts parents by you know text or phone call, and you might get a, a phone call that says your child's bus is going to be running 30 minutes late today because when I finish my route, I'll have to go out and cover somebody else's route. Um, and we're going to have to do the best we can. We don't know how many kids we're going to be transporting yet. And we don't know how many drivers, you know, we're in the process like all staffs now to look at who might have to opt out because of, you know, they're immunocompromised or they might hit one of those high risk factors. And, and since I have, you know, the top three senators on the education committee, and I know everybody's going to be scrambling for funds, but one of the things that I'd like to see the state look into is, um, bus drivers are a little different than teachers. So I only have five sick days and I don't want to put kids or other staff at risk. So if I wake up for the sniffles or if I have a fever and I have to quarantine for a number of days, I have to do that without pay. Um, and I don't want to put my drivers in the position to try to make difficult choices that, you know, you want to make the safe choice. You don't want to come to work uh, with the sniffles because you don't want to pass that on. But people also have, you know, rents and mortgages and light bills and heat bills and uh, groceries. So there's just no safety net there from the state or federal level to say, you know, hey, what am I going to do? I, I woke up this morning and, and I don't feel well. And does that mean I can come back to work after I feel better or to go back to the testing, should I have a test? Do I quarantine for seven days, you know? And the Department of Health has some guidelines, but when it comes to specifics like that, and, and what do you do when you can't go to work for five days, but I'm not really unemployed, um, and I have no leave time to fill in those gaps? So that's a, that's a big concern on my end for my group. Mm -hmm. Right. Tim, if I could just yep, jump in that quickly. Yep. So um, I've had a number of people raise this issue with me. Michael Sorotkin, who's part of the Chittenden delegation with Debbie and I and Tim, um, he chairs the uh, Economic Development Committee, which normally handles sick days and all paid sick days legislation went through that committee. But my committee obviously is the, the one most intensely interested in the functioning of the school districts. There's obvious overlap here. So I'm going to be talking with him in advance of going back in August. Is there something that we can do quickly that might pass through both houses and make it to the governor in terms of sick leave uh, that's COVID related? It's obviously a very complicated issue. Um, and there are contractual, you know, things at the district level that we'd have to think about. But I plan to be working with him in the weeks leading up to it. So um, just, just so you know, there, there is some work already being done on that. Thank you. I've got a handful of questions that have come in all on the theme of uh, personal protective equipment for teachers, staff, bus drivers. Um, I've, I've received questions sort of on all of these and the issue of who's responsible for providing it and will there be enough of it? Uh, Lindsay, maybe I'll start with you. Um, and I know that, um, different um, job types in the schools might have a different level of concern about this, but I think it's a general concern. What, 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 are, what are you seeing so far? What's your district telling you about what will be made available? Um, um, well, the district thus far has allocated funds to at least upgrading facilities needs in terms of not personal protective equipment, but um, hand sanitizers and a lot of those requirements that have been stated. Um, we also have right now an informal agreement, but we are, I think, close to a formal agreement that the district will provide at least masks and face shields um, if as required. Um, they haven't committed to a number, but I think we have an agreement um, whether they are, you know, KN95 masks or cloth masks is sort of, I think at this point, we'll pretty much take anything that they are willing to supply enough of. Um, and that seems to be pretty much across the board, support staff, teachers. Um, we have yet to really discuss, you know, whether or not some staff who work 
closely with particular children need goggles or other personal protective equipment, but um, we're hearing that that will be provided and whether procurement will be possible is a little troubling. Um, we thought, I think our supervisor union, our superintendent thought that that was going to be provided by the state at one point, um, but they have placed orders and claim that we will have that as necessary by the time school starts. Alice, um, what's is you want to give us the elementary uh, uh, perspective in this? Sure. Yeah, we totally um, would expect that the school, the employer, would provide that personal protective equipment. Um, and our district has said that they expect to do that. Um, I think that I agree with Lindsay um, that procurement is a concern. Um, my understanding, um, and I hope I have this accurate uh, for our district, is that they are looking to the state to support them in getting this equipment. So financially, uh, I, financially or, or just accessing the materials themselves, do you know the, if it's one or the other of those two? I do not, I, I certainly I know accessing. Financially, I'm not sure I can't speak to that. Um, and I know that elementary teachers are very concerned about this. Um, that's high on their list because they're even concerned that as children remove the mask for breakfast and then for lunch, and there's, we've all had the conversation about aerosols that stay aloft for a certain period of time, um, you know, and it's really important they have that protection. So yeah, I, I expect our district will come through with that. And I hope that's not too optimistic. Got it. Debbie or Phil, or shall I turn to another? I would just add um, on the end of that, when I think back to the first days of the emergency and the grocery store that I was going into, um, I think their management had every intention of getting them protective equipment, but day after day, week after week went by and they didn't have it. And the woman that was working there was dealing exclusively with customers wearing masks at that point, um, but she herself wasn't being given one. So what I worry about it, all of this uh, is, and this goes back to the theme of inequity that we were talking about before, some districts will be very well protected in terms of these physical barriers, others not so much. And at that point, what do you do? The horse is out of the barn and you're playing catch up. So I think um, to go back to a disagreement that the Senate had with the administration, the NEA had been calling for a statewide reopening task force to develop uniform principles and plans across the state. The governor didn't wanna go along with that. And I think if you look at our success as a state, the success has been generated by statewide orders. And to the extent we have deviated from that, we've had less success. So certainly when it comes to the start date of school, when it comes to, you know, personal protection equipment, can the state get involved in procurement and then uh, you know, have them go equally to districts? We're, we're past the point where we can really do that given the timing, but I think that would have been the better way to go. And one final note, the NEA is still calling for a statewide um, reopening, if not called a task force, then something that would go by the same uh, principle, which is that we want to have uniform plans rather than district by district, because that's how our system initially wound up so unequal that the courts had to write it. Um, and I fear we'll have a miniature version of the same thing. Well, the, the next question, get, oh, go ahead. Just very briefly, sorry, yep. I, I just, I think that the Department of Health might need to be involved in, um, um, in this um, discussion about how to procure uh, PPE because, you know, my role on the Health and Welfare Committee, that was, uh, they were the ones that were trying to bring PPE into the state for a variety of different, um, you know, areas that need it. And um, uh, it's hard, it's been hard because with the lack of a national uh, dis distribution plan, uh, but it, we probably need to at least centralize it at the state level. 
My next question uh, actually gets to some of Debbie's work in the Health and Welfare Committee. So Debbie's been working hard at increasing childcare support. This was pre-pandemic when there was a system that was struggling, but had an equilibrium to it that we could fund with a sort of pattern. Now, obviously, things have changed significantly. So the question um, says that, uh, I'm going to shorten the question a little bit, but it's clear that districts not having coordinated plans on reopening, that because of this, childcare has become a nightmare situation for parents in the community, employers, and educators alike. Is there any discussion to the state giving more guidance on district coordination? For instance, if one district is doing a pod model from eight to one like ours and a neighboring district is going two days a week in person, the logistics become impossible for those with children who need childcare. Uh, Lindsay, are you, how, you know, how have you, uh, you know, many of your coworkers also are facing the same challenge that the parents themselves are facing. Um, how, what have the discussions been like on the ground? Sure. Well, we are, um, all of our K through eight schools within our supervisory union are following the same plan. They are all actually going back to 100% enrollment um, minus the ones who elect a fully remote option um, and with the same schedule. The major concern that I'm hearing about from my colleagues mainly is if they themselves have a student in another district, um, which often happens, and that school is on a completely different plan or perhaps along the same vein, but a, a bigger question that I'm hearing is if and when, I think it's when we have to close again and go fully remote again to have a more solid child plan, uh, child care plan ready for when that happens. Because I think that's sort of in our district, um, because everybody's on a similar schedule for K through eight, it's less concerning right now. I think it's the inevitability that we will close completely and we'd like to be more prepared for parents and staff um, at that time who need child care options. Um, we don't have much of a plan in way of that so I can't say much more to it than that's a big concern that we do have. Jim, a related question for, for you. Um, I believe you said that the Champlain Valley School District is doing the so-called hybrid uh, model, and I don't quite know how where parents uh, are planning to have their children in the off days if they can't themselves be home. Um, are from the transit point of view, are how are how do you get um, folded into that discussion? Uh, is are, are the transportation needs in the in the non in school days sort of left completely to the parent or? is the district saying that it will step in with some kind of solution? Yeah, so the district has not sent out what I, I survey is a bad word, but they'll be reaching out to these parents who's about their transportation needs and we will accommodate what those are. It's hard to develop those plans when we don't have the actual numbers yet. I mean, um, you know, sometimes we can be an afterthought and one of the things with childcare is that that just because you take the bus in in the morning, if I have 20 kids in the morning, does not mean I'm going to have the same 20 kids in the afternoon. If they need transportation to a daycare or uh, to the neighbor's house to for that, so I can't suddenly have 40 kids try to get on my bus in the afternoon because 10 of them are going to the Smith's house. You know, as parents, a lot of parents are working on their own, helping each other out, kind of a community effort to with you know with this hybrid system which is not easy for child care so we are aware of it and there is um, a questionnaire that's going to be going out i don't have the date in front of me but i think it's next week that parents will be you know having to say whether they're going to opt in to the remote learning or the hybrid model and if they need transportation but rest assured we will get every child to school who who needs transportation without a doubt okay debbie or phil all right, then I'm going to keep turning. Um, it's it's a high. It, I, if Secretary French were here, he'd be um, he'd be uh, being very uh, dexterous at this moment because uh, there's a tremendous number of more administrative uh, questions, which I don't think would be um, quite right. But I'm going to um, I'm going to ask a. This is a question that came in, and it I think. 
for the people who are watching this, it might help explain why it's so complex and each school has its own unique uh, circumstances. Um, it, it, now I just uh, lost my place, give me a second. Oh, okay. It says, uh, will schools be deep cleaned daily or just on Wednesday? Which I think was a, a nod to the day that the schools would not have students in person. Our school doesn't have a, this is all sort of a condensed set of questions, but they all relate. Our school doesn't have AC in the classrooms. Will they not be able to use fans? And wearing face masks um, with the heat that could generate, especially I guess in the earlier fall. Um, I, I feel it is worth trying to shield the desk so the, so the teacher and student can see what is being said meaning have a shield instead of having the requirement that the teacher wear the mask so that the students can uh, see the sort of body language and the lips moving and helping communicate. So that's a, a handful of interrelated questions. Uh, Alice, you know, it, it is, is how much consternation is there at Mary Hogan about the, uh, the sort of habitability of the different spaces that are used for instruction at the school and do you feel confident that those are being addressed through strategies from the facilities team? Yeah, um, I think that as long as we have the limited number of students, uh, we'll be able to accommodate, you know, the two days a week with our hybrid model and the lesser number of students entering. Um, there is quite a bit of concern and the, the um, it's not written in stone yet what some of the procedures procedures will be um, because we're still getting new medical advice and points of view regarding shields, whether aerosols go under the shields um, and the barriers and people should now suddenly I'm hearing more about eye protection uh, than before. So uh, before it was exclusively your mask. So um, I, I think for certain special educators and Chris can probably speak to that. That's gonna be more, or um, speech language pathologists and um, people in, in that particular line that are helping kids. Um, we're talking about what kind of barriers can be set up to keep the students and staff safe in that regard. In our district, that I don't think that plan is completely finished yet, but it is being discussed. Yeah. Okay, great. I've got one I'm gonna read off and maybe this is more for um, Phil and Debbie to consider as we uh, return to the cyber state house and for others uh, in the Senate watching. Uh, as we all know, students and staff suffered trauma and isolation during the final months of the 2019, 2020 school year. As schools reopen in the fall, in whatever way they reopen, how can we prioritize addressing the trauma and stress that everyone is facing? What supports can Montpelier offer educators when they return uh, to address these challenges. So I think that's something that we just have to be thinking. We know what a very difficult situation it was and you had teachers doing a lot more than their normal uh, classroom work and, and the same with staff. And so um, I'll just flag that as something that we have to be uh, particularly attentive to. I think we've got time for one more Can I question. Can in on that oh. one, Tim? Yes, of course. So you know, we're, we're very aware that families have had vastly different experiences in this pandemic. And if you look at the plan that Vermont NEA released last week, there's a phase that involves meeting uh, with families and just assessing where they're at and where their social emotional needs are. In Montpelier Roxbury, we have a plan already to do conferences with each family uh, before school even starts so that they can um, just check in and know what needs might be there before they enter the building. And, um, you know, I, I think that's, at least for me, and I know for a lot of educators, that's at the forefront is what social emotional supports do families need. And I think um, assessing that from the get go is, is just really important. Well, Chris, thanks for adding that. It, in light of the current date of September 8th, what is the time frame that you and your peers envision that um, interaction with the students and their family occurring? I think it, it in uh, in our district we have about three weeks with a new date, 
and we think we can roll that work into that time period. If other districts have shorter periods of in-service, I personally believe that's important enough to, to push school back a couple days if need be. But I think it's, um, you know, I wish I could say there was one size fits all approach to that. And if we had a more of a clear statewide plan, maybe there would be. But I, I think it's something that um, should be prioritized. And in some districts, they can roll it into the time they have. Others would maybe have to push things back a little further to do that. Well, Chris, this may be an unfair question to ask you uh, with a limited time to answer, um, but that process of engaging with students and their families, I can imagine would be very informative in terms of how to meet the particular household's needs. Um, and I guess the, the question is, is that a process to help determine how education will be conducted or is it to say, We've determined how it's going to be conducted. Now, families, we're going to work with you to see how you will succeed with what has been decided. Because if it's the former, it raises some questions about how quickly you can then turn on the turn the education spigot. When I think about it, primarily, it's to see what uh, what additional supports students might need. If we check in with a family and they share with us that their child just seemed depressed during the pandemic. Boom, day one, we can have them check in with a guidance counselor. You know, if we have a family say, eh, my child really didn't engage in the remote learning, um, they really struggled with the math, we can have them assessed by a math interventionist. So it, it's it's not necessarily about changing the opening reopening plan, but getting additional supports, both uh, social, emotional, and academic to students that need them. And it could be that a family is really struggling. A, a lot of folks have lost jobs during this. My family's down to one income. And so it gives us that information as well. Great, well, not great that you're down to one income, but great that that process elicits the kind of information that'll help you guys make this work. Um, so I think um, we will, we're gonna wrap now, but I wanna, um, for people who jumped into the, um, the YouTube stream, maybe mid stride, uh, just remind people that Alice Shermerhorn is a uh, art teacher at Mary Hogan Elementary in, in Middlebury. Uh, Jim Johnson uh, is a bus driver in the Champlain Valley School District. Lindsay Lefebvre is a math teacher at North Country High School. And Chris Garros is a special education instructor in the Montpelier Duxbury District. Uh, two last uh, so-called housekeeping issues. Uh, the first is that the Senate is going to be doing what we call an all Senate call, meaning all 30 of us are present or as many can attend in a somewhat informal setting like this with uh, Secretary French on Wednesday at three. That discussion will go about an hour and a half. Uh, those are streamed live. So anybody who wishes to watch uh, can do so. The best uh, way to find the link is to go on the Senate website and um, we'll make it as prominent as possible for anyone who wants to go uh, to that link. Also, I know some parents are wondering uh, why they uh, were not asked to participate in, in this. And uh, as I said on the, in the beginning, we will be looking for ways uh, in the coming weeks to uh, have additional opportunities, which would be inclusive of parents. We wanted to hear from um, teachers and staff with the hour that we had uh, dedicated today, but it is not at all to say that we don't have much to learn from the parents themselves. Um, and Senators Baruth and Ingram as chair and vice chair of education will be instrumental in the Senate's piece of working with uh, the education community uh, and the governor's team in the house. And so if people have uh, specific questions or encouragement about how we might proceed uh, obviously contact your own senators, but these are two senators who are uh, very, very well informed and positioned to be helpful. And Senator Ingram's also on our health and welfare committee where a lot of these themes sort of uh, intersect. So with that, uh, I think we'll sign off and thanks everybody for watching. This is gonna be available uh, to be viewed off of the Senate's website. So if uh, someone asks uh, that they missed it, you can uh, direct them to the same link that you went to and you'll find it. And I wanna thank our four guests. Uh, we know that, as you said, the, it wasn't exactly like you got a break. It seems like it just you know, blurred from one school year into the other. And so we're very appreciative of the work you're having to do, the flexibility and 
on behalf, I think, of the whole Senate. We're just uh, so grateful that we have such great people in our education system. So thank you so much. So we're going to sign off. Thank you. And, um, and stay tuned for the Wednesday discussion if you're interested in hearing us uh, discuss with Secretary French. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.